How did paper money originate in the early United States? We just discussed how it originated in medieval Europe, and before that we discussed how it first originated in ancient China. The Chinese had developed the first paper money a thousand years before the Europeans. This video will focus on the origins in the United States, who played an important role in the next part of our journey. Before we start, if you're new to this series, let's just explain. Each of these videos can be enjoyed on their own, but the former videos add to the history. If you like this type of video, please hit the like button and subscribe to The Market is Open. We will soon be finishing off the origin of paper money series. America didn't exist. In the 1600s, it was owned by the British, French, and Spanish empires. To keep it simple, we're going to refer to the British part of current day America as the 13 colonies. These 13 colonies lacked precious metals and they had to innovate with paper money. For example, early on, South Carolina, who was one of the original 13 colonies, accepted rice as payment for state taxes. To solve the difficulty of shipping rice around, South Carolina eventually created rice paper notes. Yes, paper money was backed by rice. To make this even crazier, tobacco-rich colonies like Virginia used tobacco instead of rice as paper money. Its first tobacco paper notes were issued in 1727. However, these 13 colonies noticed that paper money was very handy when funding wars. New Hampshire, New Jersey, and New York printed notes in a war in 1709. In the 1750s, Virginia intensified its money printing in a war against France. In order to encourage citizens to use Virginia's bills, they put a 20% surcharge on all goods bought with gold or silver. Essentially, Virginia had a sales tax, but only if you bought goods in Virginia in gold or silver, meaning you would be incentivized to buy goods with their paper notes. One of the most prominent early American money printers was Benjamin Franklin, who was born in Boston in 1706. In his 20s, he worked at a printing house where he published a book that advocated for the larger use of paper money. This work at the printing press gave Franklin the money printing experience that allowed him to prevent counterfeiting. Benji Franklin was not as arrogant as John Law, who was discussed in our last video. Law unfortunately believed in a fallacy called the real bills doctrine, which was explained in our last video. Franklin also believed in this, but he was more conservative and he remained cautious in his money printing. For example, in 1728, New Jersey begged Franklin to print more paper money as it was experiencing severe deflation, which means prices were dropping. An example of this is, say you wanted to buy an apple for a dollar, in a year from now, the apple could cost something less than a dollar, such as 90 cents. We're going to explain why deflation is worse than inflation in our final video. Franklin also printed paper money for Pennsylvania and Delaware. For his great work, he is on the $100 bill today. But then Papa Britain came a knockin'. In 1765, Britain was suffering a severe recession and it thought it could raise money by taxing its favorite colony. Britain's brilliant idea was to say that these colonies had to pay a tax to print their paper money and that the money could only be printed in London. This was called the Stamp Act. The 13 colonies were quite unhappy with this and they did not enjoy being told who their daddy was. The 13 colonies also reasoned that this was a slippery slope where Britain would progressively ask them for more money through taxation. Americans like to call this later, this is taxation without representation. That's what Americans would scream to the British. And how did the Americans feel about not having a voice back in England? didn't give them any voice that's called taxation without representation and it's not fair but when the colonies complained the king said i don't care this was implying that Britain would tax Americans. Essentially, the colonies complained, but the king didn't care. In 1766, Franklin was somewhat successful and argued to Britain for the issuance of paper money. However, Britain was only half listening. It repealed the Stamp Act, but it said it had the full power and authority to make new laws and statutes. Tensions continued to rise. So a question, would a fight over paper money really lead to the American Revolution? Yes. In protest, in 1767, Maryland took the Spanish system for a currency based on dollars instead of pounds. In 1773, Britain brought tea to the US, but Americans had to pay taxes or import duties on this tea. Basically, think of it like this. Britain brings in tea that would sell for $3, but Americans had to buy it for five, and this $2 extra would be an import tax that would be sent back to Britain. In revolt for this tax, Americans seized the British ships, and they threw over the British chests of tea and possibly crumpets into the water, and hostilities continued to escalate. The first shots of the American Revolution were fired in April 1775, and by June, the 13 colonies were dead broke. 
How could they pay for this expensive war? The solution? The continental dollar. This would be the first unified paper currency of the original 13 colonies. By November 1775, three quarters of the 13 colonies' money was now paper, and they were debating further issuance. Even though some founding fathers like Alex Hamilton liked to pretend to debate if they should issue more paper during this revolution, all the founding fathers realized there was no choice, and paper money continued to fund the war effort. On July 4, 1776, the 13 colonies signed the Declaration of Independence as a symbol of their intention to break free from Britain. It's July 4, so you may think the war's over, but it actually only just begun. However, we can now call the 13 colonies the United States of America, as the name changed on July 4th. In November 1776, Britain went on the offensive, capturing New York City, and George Washington, the commander of the Continental Army, retreated to New Jersey. As Washington was retreating, the colonies printed another 5 million continental dollars, devaluing the currency by 80%. Sensing weakness, Britain tried to gain support in America by publishing articles in American newspapers, poking fun at America's paper money, which the British called rag money. The British hoped that these articles would get the people on its side. In turn, to ensure support of the people, the American government imprisoned people who did not accept the continental dollar. In 1778, the war turned back into America's favor, when longtime British foe, France, officially joined as an American ally. The French had been annoyed by the Treaty of Paris in 1763, when it gave all North American land to Britain. When France entered the war, optimism grew, and so did the value of the continental dollar. While the continental dollar actually just rose for just enough time for the US to print a little more paper money to fund the war effort, France would play a crucial role in disrupting British supply shipments, and it also sent over troops to fight the British. What's weird is that France did this purely out of spite. They were not happy about losing the 1763 war against Britain, and France would spend a staggering 1.3 billion leave funding the American war effort. This increased French total debt to 3.3 billion leave. Think about this. It expanded its debt by 50% to fund a war that had no influence on France. These types of bad decisions were common by Louis XVI, who will be discussed a bit more in our next video. But a spoiler warning is he paid with his head. France would put together a fine naval fleet, and it made it difficult for Britain to resupply its troops. Despite the help of the French, the continental dollar would eventually reach zero at the end of 1781. But before it reached zero, the printing of paper money gave America just enough time to win the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, resulting in the new 1783 Treaty of Paris, which set new boundaries in North America between Britain and the US. King George Washington, well, there's actually a bit of a debate whether he was offered to be King of the United States near the end of the American Revolutionary War, but George Washington was disgusted by the money issuance. While Ben Franklin, the famous money printer, looked at it a bit more favorably. He said technically the US had won the war without money. Franklin said, the whole thing is a mystery even to politicians how we were able to win the war without money. But if you check your history books, it was Washington, not Franklin, who was the first president of the US, and Washington's dislike of paper money was put into the American Constitution, which said that only gold or silver could be used to pay for debts. Given this law, Americans mostly relied on the Spanish dollar, which was the international currency of choice, to make transactions. They relied on this from 1790 to 1830. But as prosperity grew, an enemy of commodity money emerged, banks. Why are banks such an enemy of commodity money? Well, banks often like to lend money, and they typically do this by taking what you put in the bank and lending it out to someone else. In the 1830s, it worked mostly like this, except banks had even more power than they have today. See, when you deposited your coins in your bank, they gave you back their own paper currency. So each bank printed its own money. With all this power, in the 1830s, the banking business was booming, and even the churches joined the banking party by making their own church banks. However, with low regulations, many banks lent too much compared to how much gold or silver they kept in their vaults. For example, the Illinois bank had only 4% specie to back all its deposits. Specie just means coins that had value, like gold coins, so gold coins would be called specie. The banks had essentially created a paper money system through fractional reserve banking. Fractional reserve banking is when a bank lends out some of the deposits that you put in the bank, meaning it has more deposits than it has reserves. However, not all banks operated honestly. See, all banks enjoyed accepting gold and silver coins, but they didn't enjoy giving it back as much. Some of these banks became known as wildcat banks. They were called wildcat banks because you could take your notes to redeem them, but they only let you redeem these paper notes for gold at their head branch. And they would put this head branch in the middle of nowhere, say a desert. 
which would make it extremely difficult to get to the head branch. Therefore, it would make it extremely difficult for you to convert your notes back into specie. As can be imagined, with so many untrustworthy banks, it would be harder to transact in paper money. This early period of paper money lasted until 1863. But two things ended this early period. First, America did strike gold in California in 1848. And now America had more metal to back its paper money. So much gold was found in California that there was actually excessive inflation where prices rose over three times. Yes, let's remind everyone once again that inflation can also be created by gold. There was so much American inflation that Americans were buying goods in Europe, which led to tremendous European inflation. This led prominent European economists to advocate for the demonetization of gold. The second thing that ended this early period was the American Civil War. How many times have we gone and seen in this series that paper money is used, or should I say, needed in times of severe strain? See, governments run out of money, and they can either just declare bankruptcy, and if they did in the American Revolution, then Britain would probably own the US today, or they could print paper money dollars and imprison people who don't accept these paper money dollars. Like in the American Revolution, the Civil War was not much different, and in 1861, the North was close to financial collapse. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the US and leader of the Union, had to avert bankruptcy somehow. He suspended payments in specie, meaning you could no longer redeem your banknotes for gold or silver from the US government. And in 1862, the US was on the fiat standard which means money has value just because government said so. Lincoln had abandoned the 60-year-old constitutional prohibition by Washington against paper money, and he issued $150 million in legal tender notes. Because the reverse side of these notes were green, they became known as greenbacks. The South, or the Confederates, also required its own paper money issuance. This was an important period for money, as the U.S. would remain on a fiat standard until 1879. The fiat standard would not return after this until 1933 in the United States. Curiously, Lincoln didn't define the value of the greenback, and its value gyrated wildly throughout the Civil War, essentially meaning the greenback floated against the commodity dollar. Floating just means the market chooses the price. However, to prop up the value of these greenbacks, Lincoln made sure that citizens understood that he would be very, very appreciative if they used his dollar. Therefore, the greenbacks continued to trade close to parity throughout the war and even afterwards. The only steep decline in its value occurred after the Battle of Chancellorville, where Robert E. Lee of the Confederates badly beat the Union. To further fund the war effort, the Union passed the National Bank Act in 1863, which tried to standardize the money printing process. This meant that banks could now be federally chartered. Remember when we said that every bank could issue their own notes? This led to a lot of confusion, and the government said its motivation was to standardize this process. But its motivation was really to issue more paper money. Now, no bank could issue their own notes. As can be seen, the new notes show the bank issuing it, and at the top it says national currency. However, the government was not just coming up with new banking policy in the middle of the Civil War for a random reason. So here's how it worked. A bank would ask to join the federally chartered banking system. When accepted, it couldn't issue its own national bank notes until it bought American government bonds. When buying bonds, they would have to ship over their gold. Now this national bank would have bonds instead of gold. The government then allowed it to issue 90% of these bonds as new paper money notes. Essentially, the US government got your gold and these banks were now able to print paper money at 90% of the value of these bonds. An added benefit was there was a more uniform currency, which means more people across the country could easily make deals between each other. Given these benefits, you might think that every bank would wanna become federally chartered. They did at first. By 1870, there were 1,638 national banks and only 325 state banks. But then more banks preferred to just stay as state banks. Why? Banks soon learned that becoming federally chartered had more restrictions, such as higher capital requirements, meaning they could lend less of your money out. Furthermore, remember how banks used to issue their own paper notes? Well, they invented a new way for doing this through checks. Say John Doe is a member of Bank of America and writes a check for $1,000 to Peggy Mole. This check allows John to send his money to Peggy the exact same way that paper notes would allow him to send his money over. The war favored the Union, and the Confederates surrendered in April 1865. By the end of the Civil War, the Union had issued 449 million of greenbacks. After the Civil War, the U.S. did try to retire these greenbacks and resume this bimetal standard of silver and gold. However, retiring greenbacks would cause deflation, as there would now be less money in the system. As prices decreased, the public turned against retiring greenbacks, and in 1868, Congress suspended the retirement of greenbacks. 
The public went back and forth on its desire to return to the gold standard. In 1874, a bill was initially passed that required government to get rid of greenbacks, but as more deflation happened, it ended up leading to a bill that led to the issuance of more paper money. With a lack of fresh paper money, prices declined by an especially large amount from 1873 to 1879. Prices fell on average of 6.5% a year, or 50%, meaning an apple that would cost $1 at the start of the period would cost 50 cents in 1879. The currency was such a big issue that a party with the sole purpose of increasing the paper money supply formed called the Greenback Party. This party even got 10% of the votes in the 1878 election. However, the US did have enough gold by 1879 to allow for the resumption of banknotes to be turned into gold and 1879 is the date which many people say the US joined the gold standard. See, silver was barely used in the United States since the 1830s, when Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States, devalued silver, meaning that international prices of silver were higher, incentivizing Americans to melt their silver down and send it abroad. In addition, in 1873, Ulysses S. Grant passed the Coinage Act in which he didn't define the value of a silver dollar. Meaning, if you brought your silver metal to the mint, you couldn't get back a silver dollar. You could only get back smaller silver coins. Rather than holding small coins, it was preferable for most people to transact in gold. Eventually, many people felt this 1873 law by Grant was a conspiracy, and this became known as the Crime of 73. People said the government had conspired against silver. As outrage grew, the government said it would buy two to four million dollars of silver per month in 1878. However, this actually encouraged the people of the silver movement, and they further advocated for silver to be treated exactly like gold, meaning you could bring in an unlimited amount to the US Mint to get silver certificates. Popularity of this movement increased as the worldwide gold standard was very very unstable. In Britain, this period was known as the Long Depression. It began in 1873, funny enough, right around the start of the gold standard, and lasted until 1879 or 1896, depending on which country is used. The US economy was extremely unstable, experiencing recessions in 114 of the 253 months between 1879 to 1901. And this was under the gold standard. Prices were unstable, as if there are more goods produced in economy and not enough new gold found, then prices have to drop. The US tried to quell this increasing discomfort with another silver purchase act in 1890, saying it would buy roughly 4.5 million ounces a month of silver. This doubled the number from the original 1878 act. However, this was a double-edged sword. See, the US was on a gold standard, and by buying this much silver, it convinced foreigners that the US would leave gold, so they withdrew their money. Meaning as silver grew, gold dropped. So the US still experienced deflation because despite the increasing amount of silver, there was a decreasing amount of gold. All of this led to money becoming the main political issue of the 1896 election. In 1896, it looked like pro-silver parties would win. The Battle of the Williams began in 1896, seeing Republican William McKinley face off against Democrat William Jennings Bryan. Bryan, the eventual loser, was more pro-silver, and he said, silver was an ample supply, and if coined into money, we would restore prosperity. While Bryan lost, he did so well that the US proposed an international conference that would help remonetize silver. While this conference was being proposed, something happened. Rising gold output in Alaska and South Africa stabilized prices, and the money issue would begin disappearing. Prices rose in the US by 45% or at an average rate of 2.5% a year from 1897 to 1914 because so much gold was found. The US stock of gold more than doubled from 1890 to 1914 and the US went from holding 14% of the world's gold in 1897 to 25% by 1914. This gave the US government confidence to officially join the gold standard on March 14, 1900, where it said gold was the only standard and that money could be redeemed only for gold. We will talk about this more in our final video, but let's just say a partial commodity standard, meaning there were more notes than gold, is very volatile. This is because say you have $100 and 10 of it is in US currency and the other 90 is in your bank as deposits. But let's just say everyone in the country decided they'd rather hold $20 of currency and $80 of deposits. With only limited amounts of currency, in order for all the banks to give you an additional $10 of currency, they would have to call loans in across the country. This causes deflation and a financial panic. In 1907, a special banking panic caused the US government to act. The panic of 1907 saw the stock market drop 50%, and banks restricted the conversion of deposits into currency. Order was not restored until January 1908. In response to the crisis, the Federal Reserve was created at the end of 1913. 
The idea was to stop frequent bank runs and instability. The Federal Reserve increased rules on banks, such as mandating reserve requirements. In addition, to provide stability, the Federal Reserve would lend money to member banks in times of distress. Essentially, the idea was the money supply could be elastic, increasing when it needed to be, and decreasing when it didn't need to be. Almost as soon as the Federal Reserve started operations, World War I broke out, and European gold flooded into the US to buy American equipment. Guess what happened? Inflation. Prices rose nearly 20% a year during World War I. This helps show again that paper money doesn't cause inflation. What causes inflation is when more money enters the system and the same amount of goods are still in that country. This video is going to end here. Our next part in the series will bring America and the world's issuance of paper money into modern times. The United States was the life form that Britain created. By 1900, the US was the largest economy in the world. The US went farther with paper money and it did so earlier than Britain and more successfully than France. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe and thank you for watching.